Hey everybody, Chris Lindsay here, and you're listening to Pitch List. Join us on a deep dive into the heart of what makes writing songs and making music so magical. Let's find out what makes songwriters tick, and along the way, remember why we love music. Welcome to Pitch List. Hey everybody, I'm Dana, the producer of Pitch List, and I want to welcome you to our season four finale. Chris and I have had such a blast creating the most exciting season of this show yet. So on behalf of both of us, I want to thank everyone for listening. It means the world to us that a little podcast we started back in 2017 has reached and inspired so many of you. So let's get on to the episode. We are going out with a bang as Chris sits down with two-time Grammy award-winning singer-songwriter Natalie Hemby. You're about to get an inside look at her music journey, from the early days cutting her teeth as a demo singer and chasing the artist's dream, to writing hits for her group The High Women, the likes of Casey Musgraves and Miranda Lambert, and songs for Lady Gaga in the critically acclaimed film A Star Is Born. Not to mention her brand new solo album, Pins and Needles, the 90s rock-inspired record she's been wanting to make since the start of it all. Here's Natalie Hemby. Chris Lindsay here with Pitch List, and we have a Really great guest to finish out our season. Uh, someone I was just speaking to her, and we have not seen each other in quite a while. It's so great to see her and be able to talk to her. Our guest today is Natalie Hemby. How are you, Natalie? I'm so happy to be here talking to you. Um, I'm great. I'm I'm just like, I'm excited. It's awesome. I love this. Me too. Well, catch us up. I, I was going over last night uh, all the... You know, we've known each other for a long time. Uh, you have really been killing it lately. What What are you doing right now? Are you is the your new record? Is that your focus right now? Mostly pins and needles. Yeah, I I just, I just put out a new record um, on Fantasy Records. Uh, it's called Pins and Needles, and um, you know, it's my unabashed 1990s record. I never got to make in 1990s, <laughs> and um, so I I intentionally did that, um, but. I I've been working on that and just, I'm still writing. I'm still writing with a lot of different artists and, um, you know, during the pandemic, just like everybody else, I wrote my brains out with all kinds of people. And so, uh, a lot of that's going to be coming out within the next year. So, um, you know, you, what do they say? You, you write for like two years later, you know? (laughs) Yeah, it's true. This thing, I'm not, if I write today, it's not for today. It's for, two years later. So <laughs> I think you're right. And I always say it too, to younger writers, man, shoot that thing out there. It's got to be two years ahead. It ought to sound like it's not even going to work right now. You know, it should be, I think. I agree. Yeah, no, it does. And, and you have to really, I mean, it's just a whole lot of patience and, you know, I always tell people, I, I think because a lot of uh, people, there's, a, there are certain people in, in Nashville who just like they sneeze in number one out. But for me, it's not ever <laughs> that way. I, I literally just having a single out is a big deal. And, you know, it takes time to go up the charts. Everyone has to like it. All the labels yeah. have to like it. And then all of a sudden it's, it's like a miracle just happens and you have a number one. <laughs> yeah. And then it's like, wow, but it does. So many things have to come together. Well, now during the pandemic, did you write by zoom a lot? I did write a lot by Zoom, um, but towards the end, you know, what the pandemic's not over. But my point is, like, as things started progressing, uh, we started started getting together with people. So again, but it'd just be like one person, you know. Mm -hmm. I guess this was the case for like, hey, who's really a songwriter here? Because (laughs) because now you can't have five people in a room. (laughs) Yeah, you only have two. Wow. I didn't think about that. Yeah. And I got to at the end of the thing doing Zoom rights. And I was really happy when we started get back in the room together with people. It's it's a better experience. It is. It really is. And um you just yeah, there's this well, it's almost like um I don't know if if you were a religious person, you'd say the spirit was moving in. Yeah. You know, and it's like, there's something, there's magic when people come together. There is, there's just a thing you can't describe when you're 
physically sitting in front of somebody writing a song. It's, it's really beautiful, you know? So I never would take, I used to complain about, you know, having to drive to someone's house, but now I'm like, now I'm like, zippity doo da, can't wait to come over. <laughs> I'm like, sure, Plus, I'll come over. <laughs> yeah. And also you miss the whole camaraderie part where you're getting a coffee, hanging out, shooting the shit, you know, and just everybody's yeah. catching up or getting to know people and talking. Zoom sort of, for me, sort of made me focus more on lyrics because that's what you can kind of talk about. You can't jam, really. Look, I'm not knocking anybody who writes tracks. I think that it is part of the songwriting process. However, sometimes people can just get all wrapped up in writing this track. It's like, you no, know, what we need to be wrapped up is in the melody and the lyrics. Because <laughs> <laughs> if, if those aren't good, the track doesn't matter. <laughs> you, um, Yeah. Well, you know my wife, Amy. She's the same oh, way. Yeah. She'll just tell them, I can't think, I can't hear any lyrics. I've got about an hour before I'm going to crumble and y'all are still working on the kick drum. <laughs> I know. I'm like, well, I'm, I'm a little bit of that like that myself. I'm like, it just depends. I feel like if you are going to be, if, you, if all you do is write tracks, I think your job is to show up with a half done one. It'd almost be like me just sitting here, just like, I don't, I don't really... I don't know uh, your job to, as writers to show up with something, right? You yeah. Know? So I agree. It's, just anything like a melody or a title, yeah. something. Otherwise it's a waste of everyone's time. Yeah. So. And we, yeah, I agree. And, and I've worked with some track guys, uh, a couple of LA guys and they had like 10 tracks. They could just buzz right. through a bunch and it's like, Oh wow. That is great. You know, let's roll on that. Yeah. Yeah, I also I've ruined people who've like I've shown up to rights and they've been like, uh, yeah, I kind of like to write the track after. And I was like, well, then that means you don't really write the song because like you just, I mean, you know what I'm saying? It's like, yeah, I just I'm like, if that's your job, you need to bring it and then we'll put stuff on top of it, you know? Right. I mean, it's the better. Yeah. Route. Anyways, no, I, we could go on about <laughs> that. I've had these talks. I mean, a song is lyrics and melody. Right. It is. That's yes. It. It's not a That's drum it. part. A drum part is not a song. It's an arrangement. It's an arrangement. It's I not agree. the same as being a player on a session. It's programming and it's a, it's a, it's different than being a player, but it's not composing in my opinion. No, no I agree. I totally agree. Um, so tell us about, cause we, we, we're a songwriting podcast and we like to talk about songwriting at this point in your career, because you've got two Grammys tons of hit records and you know how how much do you write now a week or a month or do you write every day or every other day what's your typical schedule well i you know i'm a work hard play hard person so i this is what i have to do like um i'll go through these stints where like i do like a project of my own and i'll get out and i'll go play a lot and i won't write as much and then i'll go through where I just write my brains out for months and months and months and months and months. And then I take some time off again and I go back into playing and that that's really worked out for me. Um, I like doing it that way because you have to, you have to live life. You got to listen to music. You have to read books and you have to have some downtime. If you're going to write good songs or good material. And I just feel like, uh, at least for me, and I also like, I, I don't like just like, honestly, if I just wrote for country music, I would be kind of depressed. If I just wrote for one genre of music, I would say I would just, it wouldn't, that doesn't suit me. I like having my hands in all kinds of different pots. So I, that's kind of how I do it. Um, and that, that allows me time to, you know, whenever I'm just performing live and I'm not writing all the time, well, I've sit at the piano because I haven't sat at it in a while and I've come up with some new stuff and it just, it's like good stuff to have in your back pocket, you know, mm -hmm. but I, I, um, everyone's different. Sometimes I, some days, some weeks I'll write every single day. And then in another week I'll write two days a week, but I, it doesn't really matter if you ain't writing good songs. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's true. If you're writing great, you need one a month, really, or one a year. That's that's exactly right. And also, I'm a very, uh, I really enjoy writing for projects. Like, I, I know it sounds crazy, but uh, 
Like I'm not really, uh, whenever there's a pitch list going around town, they're like, we're looking for the next single. And I'm just like, well, you ain't going to find it here. Cause I, I'm just not going to write it, but I love writing for records that like, Hey, we, we need, I need kind of a, I love listening to records and then filling in the blanks. Um, I, you know, a person who's really close to me that she'll play me her stuff is uh, Marin. And sometimes I'll just be like, maybe we try to write something like a little different outside this way. You know, I, I don't know. I just enjoy doing it that way. To me, it's more like filling in the blanks of a project rather than just be like, I, we did a hit single because I feel like all my singles, I've just been really lucky that they've been singles. <laughs> Right. Well, they're great songs, but we you don't really control it, how it works is what you're saying. Right. And right. so I'm curious about this. So if Marin Morris, she comes in, is she playing you a bunch of stuff that she's recording at the time for the record and you're kind of listening for what she might need that's not there? Is that what's going on? Well, I, I don't know. I'm not like a and it or anything like that. No, but no, she no. Does, but, but as a friend, like yeah. it's more of like a tree of trust, you know, it's like, and I, I do the same with her. Like I'll go over to her house and I'll play her. I played her my record before it came out. And, you know, she's always just a bit of awesome champion of mine. And, and honestly, and I have a first and I don't need songs on her record and she doesn't need songs on mine. We're just friends. And it's just, it, it's, but it works out really well that way, but she'll play me some songs on there. And I'm like, Oh my gosh, you have to put that song on there. It's amazing. You know? And so, I, I just, I like doing that. I feel like it's a very honest way of, and an honest approach of, of, of getting good music out there, you know? Absolutely. And it's really tough for anybody to have really great vision on their own project, you know? Yeah. Well, and, and you, you need know, that outside person. Too, exactly. It's, it's also tough to trust people in town without having motives. Right. Yeah. You know, and I, I definitely, I don't, I, I, I've never, I've always checked my motives at the door. I really, I want to, if I'm going to write with somebody, I want to help them write a great song for the record. But if I, I will unabashedly say like, I am not great at writing for certain artists in town. I mean, I'm not their person. And if they asked me to write with them, I probably wouldn't because I'd be a waste of their time, you know, mm -hmm. but I do enjoy, I love, I love music. I want good music to be out there, whether or not I'm on it. So, yeah, I've known that about you and it is true. You're, um, you're one of the warriors for music, you know, you know how the town is and you stay here for a while and there are characters there's always been that get into it for other things, you know, and it gets to be a contest or sort of jock mentality of how many cuts you got. And, and it's really easy to lose that, uh, that thing about, Hey, we love music. You know, we love music and it's, I get, I'm well, I'm like you. I mean, I'm as competitive as the next person, but I love it when I hear something amazing. I mean, I love it. I, I do too. I just, it, it's thrilling to me. <clears throat> Maybe it gets harder for me now to hear something that really thrills me, but I don't you love it when you hear something amazing, whoever. Wrote. Oh, like I won't, I, I just play it over and over again. And, and I, and I always text the person who wrote it and the person who sings it or whatever. And I'm just like, this is incredible. Like, thank you so much for putting that out. And, you know, that kind of thing. And also, yeah. you know, I just think that it, it's, um, you know, people, people, it's the love of the game. It's like getting back to the love of music, but you have to go back to the heart of it. One of my favorite books that I read to my kid, it's called The Bear and the Piano. And I forgot the author's name, but it's basically <laughs> about a bear who goes in the woods and he finds a piano and he learns how to play on the piano. And, and pretty soon he's playing for all his bear friends. And then all of a sudden these two humans come up and they say, hey, listen, you need to play in the city. So he goes to the city and he sells millions of records and he does all these concerts. But there's something about that piano and being back at home he misses. So he goes back and the book ends and it says that he plays for the greatest audience of all. And I feel like every day that I, when it gets to, when all this stuff gets, when I get too wrapped up in all this crap of like whose songs are on the chart, 
you know, when award season's around, I just remind myself of the bear and the piano. Mm-hmm. At the end of the day, I did not sign up th- for this to try to win some crazy ass award. I signed up this because I love music. And yeah. so I just constantly try to remind myself of that. It's fantastic. And it's healthy. You know, it's healthy because in the beginning of your career, um, competition and that fire is great. But we know people, you know, that in our business here that it eats them up too, you know, like successful it people. And it's not, and it's in people I love and I, you know, you do too. And they're, they, they appear so consumed by this other side of it that it's like, you know, they've yeah. forgotten like, God, look, I mean, look how talented you are. Look what you've already done. You know, if you can't, I, I guess what I'm, if you can't enjoy it, what, what the hell? Exactly. And also, you know, it doesn't last forever. Nope. And so you might as well enjoy it. And, 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 if it's lasted at all, you're so lucky, you know, it's like, yeah, just have to, we're all really lucky to be able to do what we love. And, you know, that's really what it is. And you have to go back. You just have to go back to the love of it, you know? Yeah. And that's where all the magic is too. That's where all the magic is. Totally. So now you have a group also called the high women, right? That you do. Is that, and you won a Grammy with that song crowded table, right? Yep. When we won last year, um, it was during the pandemic. So they had it like online, but it was really funny because, uh, during this pandemic, uh, you know, you could still go places, but they just didn't want to have it. Um, but we were at Dollywood and (laughs) I was at Dollywood when we found out and we were with our friends and we were screaming and yelling and our friends are from knoxville and i would i call them my good luck charm but so i was like you know what i'm gonna give my i'm gonna do a little speech when we go on the eagle which is like the biggest roller coaster ride there and i had to i had to i had to uh get a like rubber bands and rubber band my phone to my hand so it wouldn't fly out <laughs> <laughs> That's great. But it was really, it was really awesome. So I was very, very proud of that. But I do, I loved Crowded Table. I I wrote that with Laura McKenna and Brandy Carlisle. And we, uh, you know, nothing, we wanted nothing more than during the pandemic than to be, it was called Crowded Table. And it's like, I want a house with a crowded table. And honestly, I just wanted to be with a crowded, (laughs) crowded room, if you will, (laughs) by that point. So. Yeah. Well, congratulations. It's a great Thank song. You. And what, I mean, that's the ultimate thing right there. The Grammy. Yeah. That's the biggest it, one of all. It is. Do you guys plan to do more recording? You know, I guess, I mean, we've talked about it. It was just like, we were just about to like do a bunch of things and then the pandemic happened. Right. Right. And so now all four of us are putting out records, you know, of our own music. Yeah. It, but I do think it's like one of those things that will will live on. It's it, the high women is like I don't even know if we'll all be able to do it the same members, but it's it's like one of those. It's like the highway men. Whoever can can do it will do it at the time. So, um, but I I do. I, it was such a beautiful, lovely ride, and and also a lovely record. I was so proud to be on that record. Well, I hope you guys do. I think it'd be an amazing, maybe in a couple of years, it'll all yeah, line up yeah, and you guys can honestly. do a small tour. It'd be amazing yeah. to see. It would be that amazing would be, to see. Yeah, it would. And honestly, there's something so crazy. Like we're, we're all four so different, but when we all get on stage, it's just like, it's electric. It just comes together and it's, it's amazing. So yeah, I hope we get to do a tour too. All right. I'm switching gears. I always like to okay. talk in the in the podcast. I always like to bring up this because I think people really relate. And everybody has them. No matter how successful anybody is, they have them. We like to talk about adversity, like the hard times. Oh, now, yeah. Now, you started young, right? Yep. And your father was in the business here. So yep. you kind of grew up around this, right? Well, maybe grew you should talk in it. Talk, in it. Yeah. Talk, <laughs> tell, tell about your dad a little bit because people may not know that. Okay. My dad is a, he's a musician. He is from yeah. Southeast Missouri. He moved here when he was young and, uh, you know, Nashville was like the place for Christian music. 
you came here for Christian music or country music. And my dad moved here and he played with this band called the Imperials. And the Imperials talk about ever changing members. <laughs> like mm-hmm. it just had, it was almost like a rite of passage. If you came to Nashville, you had to play with the Imperials at one point. So my dad played with them. And then also my uncle was a, a lead singer for them. And then he got into the Christian music scene and he started playing with this really young woman. Um, he got a tour playing with a young woman named Amy Grant at yep. the time. And my mom, uh, my mom used to clean houses and do nails on the, on the status for a living. Um, and she cleaned Amy's house. And one day she said to Amy, I can tell like you have a lot going on. I'm very good at organizing. I'm going to, I, I, why don't you let me be your assistant? So she hired her as a, her personal assistant and she still works for her to this day. Wow. So, yeah. So my family was really in, we were deep in the Christian music world and also somewhat country, but also we went to like this, I went to a church called, it was called Christ church here off old Hickory Boulevard. Oh yeah. And I mean, if you you couldn't just sing in the choir, you had to be a singer. It was like a really big deal. It was the choir that sang with Dolly when she sang "He's Alive" at the at the CMAs that year. That one. No, year I remember uh, Amy and I. Amy and I used to go. Love it there. A lot of music business people there, and that choir is amazing. I mean, it's an amazing yeah, choir. It's, it was. it's professional level choir. It it was. It was. It, they were incredible. They yeah. they went to Russia and sang like yeah. they they just sang all over the world. Well, so I grew up in this business and I, you know, I loved being around, but I, I was always in the background, just watching people. And, um, you know, because when you grow up in Nashville, it's hard to grow up here because if your family's in the music business, look, we all do it. We put people in boxes in our mind. And, you know, even if I loved music, even if I had an okay voice, I was still just, oh, that's Tom's daughter, Natalie, or that's Deanna's daughter. And right. it was sort of like, you know, I, everyone, you think because you know people, they're going to help you get somewhere. But really, that's not the case. People are like, oh, well, you're really great. I Good luck to you. It's sort of <laughs> like a you have to find your own way. Yeah. And I, I found that out pretty quickly. I also felt weird. Like I've always felt so germy weird. If I was like, Hey, would you like to listen to my music? And, you know, I didn't, I didn't know how to, I wasn't a salesperson, if you will. So I probably wasn't very good about trying to sell myself out there, but all this to say, what happened for me was I met, um, I started writing songs. The person who was helpful and I'm going to give him a big shout out was uh, Joey Elwood. Joey Elwood is at Goatee Records. Goatee Record uh, is uh, by Toby McCann um, from DC Talk. And they took a chance on me. They liked my songwriting. And they were like, look, we want to just introduce you to people and help you out any way we can. And it was just awesome. But I didn't want to do Christian music. I wanted to do Alanis Morissette rock music back in the 90s. (laughs) Right. So. Um, so I, I didn't go that route, but I ended up signing my first publishing deal with Barbara Orbison when I was really young and she was incredible. Um, yep. and she took a chance on me, you know, she was also, a, I mean, she was a very, very rich and powerful woman. Um, and she actually gave me this piece of advice that <laughs> has always stuck with me to this day, but she said, uh, Natalie, and she's German and she'd always be like, Natalie in the music business, love is money. And if they love you, they will give you money. <laughs> just, that sounds so dumb, but you know, whenever I would get a deal offer from somebody, it was a total crap deal. I'd be like, well, they obviously don't love me. <laughs> yeah. That's great. I've never heard her. I, yeah, I knew Barbara too. Um, she was great. She was, I mean, don't get me wrong. She was a little, like, she was so genius that she was a little crazy. And I heard that astrology and and like, she had an astrologer in house and yes, didn't know what she was going to be thinking tomorrow, but she did love music and she took chances on people. And I think that is, I mean, really for every young person who's in music, 
as a young person, that's all you're looking for is someone to give you a chance. And to believe you know? in you, someone to, to believe, believe in you, in you. Yeah. someone who has some sort of credibility to say, yeah, you're good or you're great or you, know, you can do this. Yes. It's, it's, it's critical. It's, Don't go away. Pitch List will be right back after the break. And, you know, I, I kept trying to, during these years, from the time I was 20 to the time I was 30, I just kept trying to get a record deal everywhere I go, but music kept changing. So, like, early on, it was, you know, people on the radio was like fastball, and mm -hmm. uh, Cheryl Crow was still on the radio, and Collective Soul. But then Britney Spears, the dawning of Britney Spears era came, and then it was like, then you had to be on TV to have a record deal. And then it was, uh, you know, it, it just kept changing. And, and then piracy was happening during that time. And the labels were merging and changing and uh, things were going online to streaming and, and to, or I, you know, iPods and all that kind of stuff. It was just really hard trying to be an artist during this time because no label wanted to sign you. They were looking for, right now, during that time, you had to be sp spaghetti on the wall. You know, yeah, throw but it up you, against the wall and see what sticks, and that's it. That's exactly right because they don't know so, what they're doing because they don't know what they're doing and they don't know what's happening. They don't know how to control this industry that they paid absolutely no attention to, yeah, when they could, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, what happened was I just kind of gave that up, and then I, I was like, you know what, I'm just gonna write songs and I'm gonna just write and. I don't know if anybody will ever cut any of my songs, but it just came down to, I want to do music and I really, I don't care what that looks like anymore. I just want to do it, you know? Mm -hmm. And that's, that's kind of where songwriting just really took off. Cause I started just writing as much as I could and with whoever I could. You know? Yeah. I, I'm trying to say this the right way. I know several people that have a similar track. Okay, to their artist career and their writer's career. And every one of them, in my opinion, are going to end up with the bigger careers on the back end as an artist. Yeah. Because they're not going to be the burnout thing. You know? Yes. They're going to be the lasting thing. Uh, Caitlin Smith, you know, who I love. I do too. Yeah. I, I, think, I think you're the same way. There's a couple other artists like that too. And plus, if you don't fit right into their little mold, you know, Yes. They're just looking to repeat what happened, which is just so dumb. I know. Well, that's the thing. It's like you have, you do have to be, kind of, you have to be your own trailblazer because they're not going to do it for you. Mm -mm. And, you know, it is, it's so funny to me. Cause like, look, there's some amazing, amazingly talented young singer songwriters and singers out there right now. And like, they just keep getting younger and younger. But I will say there is this weird thing with, with, you know, with uh, age comes, it does, it, it comes wisdom. It does come like in over time. Now yeah. I also yeah, would sure. say the more, the older I am, the less I know. <laughs> That's the biggest wisdom I have. But that is <laughs> wisdom. That is wisdom. You, you, yeah. you begin to realize you really don't know anything's possible. Yeah, anything's possible. And, you know, I, I never thought I would get a record deal at 44 during a pandemic when I'm 44 years old. That, that's my re that was my record deal. <laughs> it's right. like, are you kidding me? I would have never, uh, that story is, I would have never written that story, but I'm so glad it is that story. Because if I had signed anything back in the day, I would already be over, you know, more well, than and also now. It's, I bet I'm asking, but you've probably made exactly the record you wanted to make, right? I did. Oh, yeah. So think and about honestly, that. 20 years ago, 15 years ago, would you, would you have been able to do that? Probably not. No, I wouldn't have. No, not at all. And the other thing is that's been helpful to me is, uh, you know, social media. So yeah, we didn't have that just even hardly like we do today. Like 12 years ago, it was not like this. No. I mean, I, I am able to put out records because of social media and streaming and everything else, even though I know there's a lot of 
pay issues on that, but I, I definitely am like, I'm grateful for it. I remember when Instagram went down recently, I was like, crap. I was, I was sitting here thinking like, man, I can't even really promote my record because if I don't have Instagram, I'm really screwed. <laughs> it, but it's true. It's like, it's the, it's the new way. I mean, you know, back in the day you had to be on these big labels to make this happen. Exactly. That's exactly what I'm saying. Like yeah. you had to have a huge label deal. You have to go on radio tours like galore, which you still yeah. do if you are a major, but I'm just saying like, it's just so different. Nowadays I've found too, like you have a new artist who comes out. They're so new. They don't have any material to play. They have this one song that really hit and then they go play it live and they, they don't have any, they don't have a record. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> no, that's right. That's how quick it can happen. I mean, something can just take off like wildfire. Yeah. Hey, I just, I remember I wrote a note down. We have to talk about your little, you got a secret weapon in your house, your husband, Mike Ruckin. <laughs> just, I just want to give he a does. little, an acknowledgement to your husband. I've, I don't know if I've even hung out with him before, but I've been a huge fan of his forever. He's an incredible producer engineer. Ah, oh, thank you so much. Don't he you really think? is. Are you oh, married no, him? You I, know. Listen, my family is in the music business, and I think my dad is amazing, and my uncle. And but no, Mike has. No, he's got. He's got good taste. He has a set of ears that are very timeless, and like he has a way of getting sounds and making sounds that are just like I don't know. They just would stand the test of time. He's got. He's got a divine gift. And he doesn't like writing music. Like he and I are like, like I write the songs. He doesn't ever come in my lane and, and I am not a producer and I don't go in his the best. He he's almost like a, you know, him and Jay Joyce are really good friends, but he is like a self-contained Jay Joyce. Like he just goes in a room and he just literally chisels away at this thing. And he, it just sounds like a masterpiece at the end. Like I just really, I love his taste. And, you know, obviously I would tell him if I didn't, <laughs> <laughs> but he, I, he's so talented. I think he's, I told him like, if you ever left me, I would still, you still have to do all my records. So <laughs> <laughs> he is, he is really great. He is really great. Yeah. He is. I really, um, I'm so, I'm so, I'm very, very lucky. Yes. Um, yeah. Well, I remember we ran into you guys a long time ago at Firehouse Subs, and I think you y'all do you have two kids? We have we just have one. Just have yes. one. Okay, so I think maybe your baby was still pretty young, and we yes, ran into y'all at the was. Firehouse Subs, and I I remember you kind of looking at Amy and going, "How do you do it?" <laughs> like that uh -huh. crazy look in your eyes, and I we talked about it all the way home. I'm like, "Oh, it's I remember that. I remember those moments. It's so so hard. It's so um, hard. It's it's hard to be creative and and." if you've just had a baby and your body's recovering and yeah, you know, it, yeah, it is hard. <laughs> it's hard. It's tough for women in this business. I mean, it, it has always been, and it's way better now, obviously, but a long time ago, I mean, when Amy started, she came in before you, but she, uh, I mean, there were probably like three or four signed female writers in the town or maybe three. Oh, there was hardly any, there was hardly any female writers in town. Like, yeah. I mean, I sang, I sang all the demos in town and <laughs> back in the day. Um, and there was just a few. Yeah. I forgot about you doing demos. Let's talk about that. I think people would find that interesting. How, how, how long did you, cause you were the female demo singer for a while there. Yeah, I, I wasn't. I'll tell you what, um, uh, I chopped my, or I cut my teeth in the, uh, studio, um, I mean, because this was during like Trisha and Shania, Martina, all the us. Um, and they had these rangy songs. And yeah. I mean, people sometimes the writers would write the song and they could even they couldn't even sing them themselves. They would try to get a note out, and I'd be like, look, if I can't hit look, I, <laughs> I can't, if I can't hit it. I mean, maybe the women can, other women can, but I'm just like, if you can't sing it. Then why? We, yeah. this, this piece too high. <laughs> yeah. Well, and then the problem you get is it's like, they're not, they're in the room. They're not thinking they'll sing the verse and the chorus and they won't jump it up the octave that they're expecting to happen. So they don't even know what's going on. 
and then you try to bring it down to two, three steps to get that high note, then you're bottoming out in the verse and dragging the mud in the verse. I know yeah. I've seen it happen a million exactly. times. Um, uh, the only only song that I sang that I know that got cut it was a single. There might have been some others that were on radio cuts or sorry album cuts, but it was um, that Trisha Yearwood song. I would have loved you anyway. Oh yeah, I'd do it all the same. I love that song. Did you know? Did you have a pretty good idea when you did the demo for him that it would get cut? Did you think it was a great song when you heard it? Um, yeah, I did. I loved the song. I, I always, I definitely there were songs. I mean, that was the other thing as a songwriter. <laughs> I was like, all right, this song is an absolute turd. Like, yeah. <laughs> I'm just like, <laughs> I, I definitely was paying attention to what, you know, maybe constitutes for a good song and what doesn't. So that's well, um, that's my next question. So you did a lot of song demos. I mean, you know, not all of our songs are great. I mean, I'm sure as a demo singer, you you heard things and you're like, oh my God, this isn't very good. I hope I can get something out of this, you know? Oh, listen, I have written some massive turds. Um, and I, I just don't think you're not a songwriter if you have not written some terrible songs and there's some, and then there's some terrible songs that become huge hits. <laughs> you know what, Natalie, so, that's, that's right. You're right. You're not a songwriter. If you haven't written some shitty songs. You haven't done it enough. You you have had to, yeah. You're absolutely right, and more than one. I, I, more than one. I mean, yeah. I have I have written some awful songs, and at the time, I thought they were amazing. <laughs> it's crazy, isn't it? Isn't it crazy how you can get talked or swayed into doing something, and then you go back and listen to your later, like, damn, that was a terrible idea. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm constantly amazed. I'll listen back, or you know, the other one is. You're in the room and you're having all these doubts in your mind, but you've got two other writers who are just running over you and you're oh, like, you kind of yeah. go with it. I'm totally going to call out Shane McAnally because he's one of my favorite people to write with and he's my friend, but Shane could try to get me. Well, he got me and Busby to write his song idea. He wanted to write a song called Jumbotron. And it is the dumbest song ever. <laughs> <laughs> We totally it's, wrote it. Yeah. And it's like, <laughs> put me up on the jumbo, Tron. It's like so bad. And <laughs> I sang, he sang it and I sang with him. And I was like, I hate you. But okay. And he's like, can't, can't you hear cha-ching in your ears? <laughs> I'm like, no. It's <laughs> a perfect um, example. It's a perfect example. Three incredible writers. You know, Shane is known for, for his lyric genius. You know what I mean? And it's like he's a genius. Yeah. And then, but that's what happens, man. You get this one thing stuck in your head and you just get blinders on. It's really weird. <laughs> you know, I know it's well, really weird. The thing is you get suckered into it because you don't really know. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, and somebody's like, passionate, somebody like him, it's passionate. You're like, yeah, well, yeah. Okay. Maybe I'm okay. Yeah. I guess I could see it's a, Yeah. You know, I'm it's sure like it was going like, fishing. It's like, you know, you, yeah. some, sometimes the worm works, but you know, what if you put a piece of popcorn on the end there? You just yep. never know what people are going to bite on. <laughs> yeah. Tom Douglas used to say, um, or might've been the war Brett Warren said, Tom throws his fishing line way out further than everyone else. And sometimes he catches <laughs> the biggest fish. And then sometimes he brings in like a license plate and an old boot. <laughs> <laughs> so true. That's yeah. So true. Oh yeah. No, Tom is, you know, he, I would agree with that. Yeah. <laughs> He's oh, amazing. He'll, yeah. He'll, he would tell you himself. He will, he will, uh, he'll you get a whole song done with him and he starts writing something that he has like a whole, uh, addendum to the song. You know what I mean? Like a whole other thing. Oh yeah. He's well, a, I wrote a song, um, uh, with Daniel Tashin when I was 20 or maybe I was 21 it's called Italy Nights, and it's literally the most literal song about Italy. <laughs> I was like, I was like, people, people are gonna love this in Italy. Like, this song is really good. And it, I, so I played it at this event called the First and the Worst, and it's where songwriters play their first number one hit, and they play their worst song they've ever written. And I played Italy Nights, and I won <laughs> the award. I won cra the crappy award. <laughs> Like everybody else sang songs because they wrote the song as a joke, but I was dead serious. 
thing was oh, amazing. <laughs> yeah. I mean, like you said, we all have them. That's great. Who does that? The first thing. I love that. I need to go watch one of those. Yes. The oh, they're worst. great. <laughs> so, and we, 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 de we detoured a little bit, but my question was about adversity. So the adversity for you sounds like you started out intent to be only an artist is your goal. And then kind of got stalled a little bit in there for several years and then sort of moved to writing and everything just sort of worked big time. Is that, is that accurate? How much time in there were you kind of in limbo? Oh, I was in limbo for years. I mean, I, I call myself a 14 year overnight success. Um, I mean, I literally, the adversity for me was like, it was really hard for me because nobody told me, Hey, you really suck. You need to hang this up. Everybody, even the labels that I would meet because with, you, because you're great. That's why they wouldn't tell you that. Well, but they know nobody knew what to do. You know, this goes right. to show you though, you can be good at something, but people don't know what to do with you. Right. And maybe I didn't, maybe I didn't know what to do with myself, you know, but I, I definitely, the adversity was basically, there was two things that I felt that were always working against me. Number one, I didn't, is even though I grew up in the business, I didn't really understand the business. I didn't really understand what it was like to be an artist. Didn't understand what I was signing away. Didn't understand what I was getting myself into. And, you know, and how many, I don't know. It, a lot of it had nothing to do with music, you know? <laughs> that was number one. Number two, the other thing that I always felt working against me was growing up in Nashville because I loved Nashville. And I was surrounded by people in the music business, but like everybody else was trying to be successful in their own right. So they didn't, nobody wanted to help me. You know what I mean? Right. And I, I so I just kind of, I, I had a hard time because I always wanted to do like, I wanted to do roots rock music. I wanted to do like Tom Petty -ish style, Cheryl Crow that was already out there. And so it was sort of like, I just had a really hard time figuring out what made me so different than everybody else. And so for me, getting over that adversity was just never giving up. And then now what makes me different from everybody else is, is it's really just the time I've spent in music. And also um, I think bring I, I like the fact that it's been so long since it's been the nineties that I can kind of bring it back in a way. <laughs> and now it's a fresh sound. <laughs> it is, it is, yeah. it is. And I think also the amount of success you've had as a writer and you to have your family and have your life the way you have it, you know, I think it would make it easier for you to really be the exact artist you want to be instead of the compromises that everyone has to make or yeah that. so I'm sure i think that's beautiful too and you don't have to maybe do some of the things that you would have had to do you know absolutely you know and you know an adversity looks like it so it looks different for everybody you know mm -hmm. my was never about like a, a lack of love of it or or it was just like i just kept getting the door slammed in my face yeah <laughs> Or actually, it would never slam. It was always left a tiny bit open, but it just never opened all the way. And it took me a long time for it to finally do that, you know? Yeah, and it probably just where you were, just them trying to figure out where's your slot, you know, and where we can, you know. And, and, yeah, you know, that, that's what they're looking for. It's, it's yeah. a money-making business, you know? But again, they don't see the thing that's, the, the pisser is they don't really know. And yeah. I don't know if that's gotten any better because apparently now they're just going to watch people's social media numbers and, <laughs> and, and then sign them off of that. I mean, we could go on and on about that. What's your, oh, uh, yeah. what is your, um, now when I worked with you a couple of times, you were at the piano. Are you mostly right at the piano or do you do guitar? No, I write a guitar too. Yeah. Okay. So you do um, both. I do love piano, but I, I, I write on guitar too. Yes. A lot. So, um, and I do, you know, I, I write with people who do tracks as well. I love doing mm -hmm. that. Um, but yeah, it just depends on, I mean, piano has, it's just a completely different vibe, obviously, but, uh, country music is just inundated with, with gu acoustic guitar. So that's, I do write a lot on acoustic guitar as well. So. Yeah. Yeah. I finally 
figure that out for myself. It's a guitar format, you know? It is. It and, is. You know, if you write a song on the piano, chances are it's a slow song. So, yeah. But I don't know. I never would. I wrote Crowded Table on the piano and I never would have guessed in a million years it would win a Grammy. So, if you, See, that's I would say, thing. you just don't know until you write the song, right? Right. What were you going to, I interrupted you. What were you going to say? No, uh, like if, if you don't write the song, you don't know where it will end up. And, you, you know, I just, I have to switch instruments. Like sometimes I'll write on the whirly, you know, mm -hmm. it's just sometimes, it's sometimes I don't really write. I use a lot of instruments. It's just like, I come up with this melody. Um, I've brought in melodies to, to guys who do tracks before and they will build a track around it. So, you know, just whatever works. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know what? Uh, I've loved talking to you, Natalie. I, I could get a go get a coffee and keep going for two hours. Um, Same here. But I know you've got a busy life. Um, we, uh, you're going to be our season ender. And well, I just really, really, really appreciate you taking the time to be on the show. Um, I'm going to list thank all you for your having me. Oh, listen, it's our pleasure. We've been wanting to get you on for two seasons. Uh, I love your new record, Pins and Needles. It's awesome. Your Thank first you so record much. before that is amazing. I want everyone listening to go straight to Spotify and start getting that stuff or Apple Music, wherever you get your music. Check Natalie out. It's so good. And then really, really hoping once we get everything settled down that you'll be out touring and we can update the Pitchless Nation on your uh on your uh, touring, which hey, in your group or by yourself. Yes. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so uh, thank you so much for being on, Natalie. Really appreciate thank it. Thank you, Chris. You. I love you so much. And thanks for having me. I really appreciate you. And thanks for doing this, this podcast. So You bet. We love you too. Thanks for listening to this episode of Pitch List, produced in partnership with the American Songwriter Podcast Network. If you enjoyed today's show, Please subscribe to us on Apple Podcast or your preferred listening platform. And if you want, feel free to leave us a five-star rating and review. For exclusive content from this week's guest and more, you can visit our website at pitchlistpodcast.com or follow our social media pages on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. To hear songs written and or recorded by today's guest, check out this week's playlist by finding us on Spotify at Pitch List Podcast. Plus, don't forget to let us know on social media what songwriter, musician, or music business professional you want to hear from next. Thanks again for listening, and we'll see you next time. I wrote that with Lori McKenna and Brandy McCarlisle. And, you know, did I say McCarlisle? I did. <laughs> no, I understand. I know what you meant. Oh my gosh. She's going to kill me. She's going to think that is so funny. Um, Brandy McCarlisle. No, 